Uh, hello, this is Dr. Mohammed, and this is another video under seismic design of structures. Still, we are talking about ASCE 7 seismic provisions, and uh, I am going to talk today about three different uh, points. I'm going to talk about the equivalent lateral force ELF method, uh, and seismic response coefficient, and vertical distribution of seismic force. Uh, as usual, we are giving like the rationale behind each item or each topic, uh, and after that, we take like an example to understand how we can implement and apply it. So let's go now with the first point, which is ELF uh, method. Uh, equivalent lateral force analysis or equivalent lateral force analysis method. Uh, it is uh, like a, a way <clears throat> or a method that is being used by ASCE in order to obtain the base shear, okay, the base shear. So at the end, we want to know what is, if we have a structure, at the end, we want to know what is the value of the base shear that is going to be developed from any earthquake that is coming. So the, the value of the base shear that we are going to uh, estimate here, it is a kind of conservative and uh, if you are going to compare it with the real forces coming from the earthquake you are going to find that we are in the uh, conservative side highly conservative but anyway this uh, guarantees for us our structure to behave well during the ground excitation so i'm going to talk about the code section for base shear i'm going to take uh, the section and explain about it from ASCE 7-16. I'm going to talk about the rationale of or behind the seismic response coefficient CS which is commonly used in our design uh, as a factor or a portion or this is the factor actually whenever that we use V we are going to put it it equals CS uh, times W as we are going to see so we want to know more about this CS and the different equation that is controlling it we're going to talk an example for the base shear. After that, we are going to make a look to the vertical distribution of the seismic forces, how we can distribute this force, which is V, on the structure in a way that is going to be consistent with the mode shape uh, or the fundamental mode shape of the structure. And then we're going to take an example, end up with an example with the vertical distribution of seismic force. Okay, now let's go and see the code section for base shear. So uh, actually this is part from the ASC 716 and you are going to find it under section 12.8 which is titled with equivalent lateral force ELF procedure. Uh, they are stating that so seismic base shear, the seismic base shear V in a given direction shall be determined in, in accordance with the following equation. So this is the main equation, which is as I said, CS times W. CS, it is the seismic response coefficient, and it is determined uh, based on this section, which is section 1.1, uh, 12.8, 1.1. And W, it is the effective seismic weight, which already we have explained in the previous video. Okay, and you can revisit the section and revisit the video to understand what is the meaning of the weight. And in the same time, the calculation of the seismic response coefficient, which is the CS, <clears throat> it is going to be determined accordance with, uh, as we are going to see, there are uh, five equations going to control it. So we have equation uh, 12.8-2 and dash 3, dash 4, dash 5, and dash 6. Okay, so we have five equations and I'm going to explain all of them now. So the first one, which is the general one, it equals to SDS over R over IE. R, it is response modification factor, and this is importance factor for seismic or earthquake and SDS, it is the design spectral acceleration for short period, okay? This is already the definition of these items already I have explained in detail in the previous videos. 
So CS is going to have this value based on this equation, equation 2, uh, if we know all of these information. But in the same time, there is a limitation on the value or the magnitude of the CS. The value of CS computed in accordance to this equation need not to exceed the following. So we have some like lower limits here that we should not go beyond it. So it is based on T, the period of the structure, how we can evaluate it. Go back to the previous video. TL, it is the long period on the, uh, for the site of the structure. If we have the response spectrum, we're going to find TL, it is the long period here. We can obtain it from the seismic maps. It's provided there or given to you. And for T less than TL, so if we're going to talk about this here, anything less than TL, then CS equals to SD1, not SDS in this case, because this is <coughs> uh, uh, the design spectral acceleration at one second over T. So now we started to find T is taking place here times r over i, this vector, and if our t is larger than tl, it is larger than very long, very flexible system, then cs is going to be related to t squared in the denominator here, and we're going to have tl is going to be added to the equation, the previous equation here. And in all cases, cs shall not less than, shall not be less than, 0.044 SDS times IE and it should be larger than 0.01 and in the same time in addition for structure located uh, where S1 is equal to or greater than 0.6 this is for pulse sensitive sites CS shall not be less than C 0.5 S1 over R uh, over IE okay so these are the five equations that we have the five equations that we have let's go and understand the rationale of this of the seismic response coefficient the rationale for each equation first of all uh, v it's the base shear w is the weight then this means that this must be this is force unit okay and this is the weight which is another force unit but you can look to it as if it is a mass so equation 12.8-1 simply expresses the base shear as the product of effective seismic weight and response coefficient. If you want to say that this is force, then this is a coefficient. If you want to say this is a mass, then CS is going to be acceleration. Okay. So actually it's units, as we're going to see here, the response coefficient is a spectral pseudo acceleration in G units gravitational acceleration which has been modified by r and i as we are going to explain in the in the next uh, slides for inelastic behavior and provide improved performance for high occupancy or essential structures actually r it is giving us like the importance factor so this is to provide improved performance however r it is related to the inelastic inelastic in elastic deformations however i as i said it is it is the importance factor it is giving something else for us increasing the base shear to make our structure to be more elastic okay so they are like different and contradicting two sources that we are going to apply but anyway what i want you to understand here it is the units of cs as we are claiming here it is little it is g it is a little bit confusing because this is force and this is force this should be g but actually you should not look to it in this way consider it as a factor if this is a weight consider it as uh, sorry if this is a weight and consider it as uh, acceleration if this is going to be the mass okay okay now let's go to the and see what is the the main idea and rationale behind the equation there are three different equations. We have we said that there are five equations, right? I'm going to talk about the three, the first three of them now, because the first three they are providing for us the inelastic response spectrum. Okay, because all of them they are having this factor which is R in the denominator. This means that 
all of them we are like reducing reducing the elastic response spectrum we are reducing the design response spectrum sds is reduced sd1 here and sd1 also in the numerator this means that they are reduced by r so the first three are plotted as you can see here in this figure these equation represent in elastic response spectrum this equation represent in elastic response spectrum so actually the first equation it is which is two equation two here it represents the constant acceleration period or the uh, yes the the range of uh, constant acceleration however for constant velocity it is represented by this equation okay and equation four it is used for constant displacement okay what is the meaning of constant acceleration and constant velocity and constant displacement please visit like three four videos before i have explained this in detail okay and you're going to find it under the response spectrum video category okay so we understand well what is the meaning of this of these periods now so this is why you're going to find for example here it is sds is going to be used because commonly we are under the short period short period range so if we are going to use sds the design spectral acceleration for short period but if we are going to in this direction this means that we are having exactly long period and the spectral acceleration at long periods which is sd1 is going to be used so here we're going to find sd1 and S D1 also going to be used here. However, here it is SDS for short period. The controlling one is the short period spectral displacement. Okay, so now we understand why it is SDS here, SD1 here, and SD1 here. Now let's go to see what is the effect of R and I. As we said, we have two different sources one source it is the response modification factor which is taking into consideration the energy dissipated by the system based on the type of the system in order to dissipate the energy under the inelastic behavior of the structure so r it is reducing the elastic to inelastic or it is reducing the base shear okay and I have explained it in the previous video in detail. And I, it is the opposite, which is whenever we have an important structure, we are representing its importance based on the seismic design category and based on its occupancy and its importance. So we give it like, like 1.5, for example, or 1.25, increasing the base shear by 25% or 50%. This means that we are, we are uh, adding to the structure in a way or adding base shear to the structure in order to make it elastic. These are, they are contradicting one another. So this is why we put it R over I. Or you can understand it in a better way, like saying that CS equals to SDS, okay? This is the acceleration, times I over R. I will increase by I and I will decrease by R. That's the meaning here. Okay, so this is the rationale of the equation itself. Okay, another thing, another interesting thing that you're going to see, let's clear everything here. You're going to see that we have T here and T squared here, but we do not have any T's here, right? Why? What is the reason for this? It is found that in the velocity sensitive region, the base shear is highly dependent on T. The increase of T would decrease the base shear, as you can see. Increase of T, as you can see it here, it is decreasing. The spectral acceleration is decreasing, so the base shear is decreasing. Okay. And we found that starting from this part here, uh, the long period, we found that the base shear is related to to the power t to the power two t squared okay as you can see it here so anyway t is very important item for the base shear the elongation 
in the structure period would decrease CS and consequently the base shear. However, in this period, which is the constant acceleration period or the acceleration sensitive region, we are talking about SDS and T is not there. T is not there. Okay. Okay. Now we understand now at least what is the, the meaning for each one of uh, uh, each uh, element of the equations. Okay. Okay, but anyway, as I said, this is to control and give us the meaning of the inelastic response spectrum, and they are reflecting the importance of the structure and the contribution of T and the spectral displacement and spectral displacement, uh, sorry, the uh, design spectral acceleration at short period and long period. Okay, let's go to understand the rationale of the first one which is the constant acceleration constant acceleration equation this is sds over r over ie okay as we said this is for this period constant acceleration between t equal to 0 or t equal to ts this is ts that is given to us for short periods the t that is distinguishing between the short period structure and the medium and long period structure TS, this TS, actually, it depends on the seismicity of the site. So maybe you can find this TS to be 0.2 second. Okay? For low hazard regions, if we are in the low seismicity regions, TS is going to be around 0.2. Okay? On site class B. Or maybe it reached like 0.9. Okay? For high hazard regions. Okay? So this, this, line it highly depends on the seismicity of the site okay okay so this is the the point another point is in this equation we do not consider this part which we call it the transition to peak ground acceleration it is not it is not used for elf method this one is not used why what is the reason for this Actually, in this region, which is very short, it is less than T node, okay, very, very short uh, period, means that the system is highly stiff, highly stiff. For very high stiff systems, the inelastic, or we can say the reduction of the response by the response modification factor is not right. There is no much, no much reduction in the response spectrum response uh, due to uh, the inelastic uh, contribution because it is very stiff structure can you imagine that we have a very stiff structure okay very stiff and the structure when we are talking about the structure we found that the structure under the earthquake it is moving with the ground because it is really like as we said it is rigidly connected to the ground and it moves back and forth with the ground this means that there is no way for the inelasticity to be propagated in the system itself. And then reduction using R is not, uh, is not accurate. It is exaggerating. We are exaggerating if we are going to use R here. The system would not dissipate the energy that we are stimulating in the code using R. Okay? So that's the, the point here why we are not, we are not using this part. Okay? The true pseudo acceleration response spectrum transition to the peak ground acceleration as the period approaches zero, which is this part. This transition is not used in the ELF method. We're not using it. One reason is that simple reduction of the response spectrum by 1 over R, which is commonly we are using, in the very short period region, very short period region means what? Very stiff structures would exaggerate inelastic effects. That's right, because the structure is very stiff. There is no way it will, maybe it will go, yes, inelastically, but, but it will be exaggerated if we use the R, okay? Okay, now let's go to the next, which is equation three. And this equation CS, as we said, we are using SD1, not SDS, because we are in, the, in this region, this period. So we are under SD1 domain. 
R over I, you understood them, and T, it is in the denominator. Denominator means what? That the in this region, as we said, the seismic response is inversely proportional to the period. And this is very true, as you can see here. When we increase T, the seismic response is increasing, uh, decreasing. The, of course, this is the spectral acceleration, and also the design base shear is going to decrease. Okay, and the pseudo velocity is constant. The pseudo velocity, it is constant in this area, as we said, constant velocity region. Means what? What is the meaning of constant velocity region? The velocity of the uh, system is highly sensitive to the velocity of the uh, to the ground excitation, and it equals it in some uh, area. It equals it equals it. If you remember the tripartite, uh, I hope that you can remember this. The tripartite that we have something something it was something like this do you remember and we said that for the velocity this was the velocity axis and here it is the same the constant velocity constant velocity region okay so this is the portion of it which is this part okay remember or go back to the video of the tripartite uh, response spectrum and you will understand what I'm talking about and then we have, yes, this is T and the range, as we said, between TS and should be less than TL. This is uh, actually, uh, this is the case here for T. Yes, this is for T between TS and TL. Where is, this is TL here. And this TL, as I said, it is ranging between 4 or 16 seconds. This TL, it ranges between 4 to 16 from where we can get this, you can obtain them from the figures in ASCE, figures 22 and chapter 22, dash 15 to 22, 20. You are going to find them. Okay. Okay. Now let's go to the next equation, which is equation number four. And you are going to find the same as previous, except that we added TL here and T, it is squared now. So we have two things. So this is this is the area that is dominant here, starting from here to here on. Okay, so this is for T larger than TL. This is constant displacement. The displacement of the system equals to the displacement of the earthquake ground excitation. Okay, so given the current map values of TL, this equation only affects tall and flexible structure. That's right. Whenever we have T here, which is four or five seconds, for example, this is very flexible, very flexible structure, very tall structure, or maybe very flexible structure. Okay, so this, this one is highly dependent on T, highly dependent on T. And if the T is elongated, you are going to find that the response is going to be decreased uh, significantly. Okay, but remember that TL TL is the in the numerator. This means that the more TL is, the more uh, kind of uh, seismic base shear is going to be developed. Okay, now we have understood uh, the equation, the main three equations, which is forming the inelastic, the inelastic response spectrum. However, that we need to put some limitation. Okay. There is some lower limit. Our base shear should not uh, go lower than certain value. So they found that this value, which is 0.044 SDS IE, should be the lower value. And actually, it has like history. This minimum base shear was originally enacted in 1933 by the state of California's okay, act. So this means that it is historical also related to California and this value should not be, it should not go beyond 0.01, okay? It should be larger than 0.01 and so less than, I mean that it should not be less than 0.01. It should equal to 0.01 or uh, larger, okay? And this, they found that this, this equation, it, it is providing like 3% almost of the 
weight, which means that it would equal to 0 0.00, uh, sorry, it equals to 0 0.03, okay? So it means that at least it should be 1% of the weight. So the base shear should be at least 1%, and this is actually and consistent with, do you remember seismic design category A? Uh, when we design it, we do not design it for any seismic shear or something. We design it only for integrity based on 0 0.01, uh, the weight, 0 0.01 of the weight. So this is the minimum that we should maintain here, and it represents like 3%, okay, 3%, the minimum base shear. Okay, another minimum, which is CS, we found that in uh, whenever that we have some buildings, okay, that is near to the fault or near to, yes, if we have a fault here and we have buildings here, we found that these buildings are like behaving a little bit differently. So we found that we need to put some minimum limit for the seismic coefficient. So how we can limit this, we found that S sub 1, take care, S sub 1, it's not SD1, it is S sub 1. It is the, uh, the mapped spectral acceleration at one second. We found that uh, whenever that S sub 1 is larger than certain value, which is 0.6G, then there is some minimum requirements we need for the building in this case. So we put a limit for this. So this equation applies to sites near major active faults as reflected by values of S1, as we are going to see, okay, where pulse effects can increase long period demands. The point is we found that if the structure is near to the fault, there is pulse effect. Pulse effect means it is as if the, the earthquake making something like this. Okay, and then making... In very short period, there is a great deal of amplitude. Okay, in very short period, this makes the structure to be like going under the pulse effect. Uh, this actually provides a great deal of energy in a very short time. So we found that it's better to relate relate our minimum base shear for those buildings with SA, uh, S1, which is long period. We found that this pulse effect can increase long period demands highly, significantly. So this is why we used S1. Okay. Okay. Now let's go to have an example and try to wrap up what we have started in this uh, video. Okay, now let's have a design example, uh, seismic base here. This is from the seismic design manual, as I said, okay, uh, 2010. IBC, 2015, and ASCE, 2010. The problem statement is for five-story steel, so we are having steel special moment resisting frame building. Shown below, this is, as you can see, it is regular, and its height is 60 foot. The following information is given. Seismic design category is D. SDS 0.45, SD1.28, I1, R8, the seismic effective seismic weight given. HN60, long period, uh, long period value 8 seconds. And S1, we are going to find that they are going to provide it at the end. We need it actually. It is 0.21G. So what we want from here is determine the following, uh, the period of the structure, seismic response coefficient CS, and seismic base shear. So we are going to the period of the structure in the first place, and then from here we can go to the next, uh, the next requirement. Okay. So the period of the structure, if you, we, we actually have the approximate fundamental period that we have explained in the previous video, can recall it. So our system is steel moment resisting frame going to table 12.8-2 and for steel moment resisting frame CT is going to be 0 0.02, 0 0.028, X is going to be 0 0.8. Then we are going to use equation 12.8-7 in our ASC7 
which is CTH to the power X. CT is 0.028, as we said, and here we have 0.8. The height is given already, which is 60. Our structure is 0.74 T uh, seconds uh, uh, appro approximate period. Now let's go to the second requirement, which is the seismic response coefficient CS, which is our main target for today's video. So first of all, as we said, we have five equations. Equation two, three, four, five, and six, right? So we need to check all of them in order to... First of all, we are dealing with the CS to be smaller of this one, which is dash two, and should not be less than these two. Do you remember? Which is uh, equation three and four. Okay, so this is the general one, and here we have two limits based on T, whether it is less than or equal to TL, or T larger than TL. So let's uh, substitute in this one. We have SDS, this 0.45 given to us. R, response modification factor is 8. I, it is 1. Then we can obtain it 0.05. The other limit for our T, our T already it is 0.74. Our TL, it is 8. So anyway, this is going to be our the one that is working, not this, because this equation for T larger than TL, but our T is less. But anyway, we calculate it for information. So SD1 here, T, which is 0.74, R over I, 8 over 1, and SD1 is given 0.28, calculated 0.047. So the original one, 0.05, here it is 0.04, then we are going to take this one up till now. This equation, no need to uh, check it, okay? But anyway, it's only for your information. We, uh, like, substituted. Everything is given TL and 2 squared and so on, so we got it 0.5. Okay, but as I said, our T is, is not larger than TL, so no need to check it. But, so from here, from this one and this one, we should take the smaller, then we're going to take 0.047. But it should not be less than the minimum. So we have the minimum here. The minimum are two, two things. One minimum, which is historical background, 3%, as we said before, with this equation. And the other one, it is related to the pulse effective or pulse sensitive area, which is near fault. So here we need 0.044 SDS. It is given for us as 0.45 and I it is 1. So we found that it is 0.0198. As we said, it should be larger than 0.01. So it is okay here. And in the same time, the in addition for structure related with where S1 is equal to or greater than 0.6G, it is given already in the, in the code section that I have shown to you in the beginning of this video. It shall not be less than 0.5 S1 over R over I. So in this case, you are going to find that it has a value. He didn't, he didn't here, uh, he didn't calculate it. But if you calculate it, you are going to find that it doesn't control. So it does not control. So from here, we have here 0.012. It is the minimum. Our one was 0.04, so it's, it's better. So we are, uh, I mean that it's larger. Then we are going to use this CS here. So our CS is going to be 0 0.049. Okay, now the next one, only for, for as a reminder, as we said, because we have the value of CS, this is the general one that we have explained, and then it should be not, okay, not exceeding this value, CS, for T less than, or this value for T larger than TL, but it shall not less than this value. And this one for the S1 equal to or greater than 0.6G. Okay, so it shall not be less than this value. Okay, even that you substituted here with 0.21 because I, I give it to you 0.21, you are going to find that it does not control our, our, um, our case. Okay, now this is the seismic base shear. It is going to be CS times the weight, and then we are going to find it is 76. Okay, and this is the commentary that I've said. He should give S1 in the beginning, actually, to make, make it clear for, for us. Okay, so it is 0.21, and point if it is greater than 0.6, we should use it. Okay, 
So actually, even that we should not use the equation at all because S1 is less than 0.6 g, so no need to check this equation. Okay, now let's go to the next part, which is related to the vertical distribution of seismic forces. Uh, in the code, code section uh, 12.8.3, vertical distribution of seismic forces, the lateral forces, okay, which is coming from the base shear that we have explained in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, slides, we need to give this base shear, we want to distribute it to the different stories on the structure. So the code is giving to us certain formula, which is CVX times V equal to FX, where FX it is the force that is going to be the base shear of or the shear story shear, okay? And it is a function in uh, factor multiplied by V, and this factor is going to be given here. It is also related with the weight of the story times the height of this story from the ground and raised to power k, we're going to talk about it, and it is divided by the summation of this multiplication for all stories. Okay? The details are going to be here. For this k, this small k, it has like a value. We're going to see that if uh, the structure have period 0.5 or less, k is going to be 1. If it's 2.5 seconds or more, k is going to be 2. If it's between 0.2 and 2.5 seconds, k shall be 2 or uh, linear interpolation should be given. I'm going to talk about this in detail. Okay. So first of all, what is the understanding of this fx that we want we are talking about? Okay, it is, it is fx, as we said, it is like equals to c uh, vx times v. Okay, so this fx means what? It means that the weight of the floor times the acceleration that it experiences. So this is the meaning of fx. Okay, and it is dominated, as we said, this equation that we have explained, which is equation 12, is based on the simplified first mode shape shown. This is the mode shape first. This is the first mode shape of this structure, as you can see. We do not have any other mode shapes that we are going to talk, talk about. It is only the first mode shape. This means that the distribution of the forces on the building, it is related to the first mode shape, not higher mode shape, right? But there is something we are going to talk about it, which is the key component, which is key component, which is controlling the higher mode effect. Okay. So in figure Fx is the inertial force at level X, which is simply the total acceleration at level X times the mass of level X. And this is true. The base shear is the sum of these inertial forces. That's right. So if we have a base shear in the, in the, in the ground, this is V. So all the forces coming at each floor, the summation of them is going to be V, this V. And this equation, which is our equation CVX here, it is giving the ratio between the floor force and the total base shear force. Okay. This deformed shape that we show here, we can control it by the k. There is a factor here which is k. We are going to use it in order to control this shape because maybe there is or there are higher mode effects that is going to contribute to this, so to the behavior of the structure. So we are going to use k to control the shape itself. As you can see here, it is not like linear. It is a little bit but parabolic, for example. So we can control the this parabolic curve using k, the exponent of the equation here. Okay, so how we can use this? Uh, as I said, k is all about the contribution of higher mode effects. It is the contribution of higher mode effects. So the variation of k with t is illustrated here. So this is k, and here this is t in seconds. 
So if it's less than 0.5, it will be 1. If it's larger than 2.5, it is going to be 2. In between, there is interpolation with this equation. Okay. The exponent k is intended to approximate the effect of higher modes, which are generally more dominant in structures with longer fundamental period of variation. And this is important. If I ask you, what is the contribution of k? You're going to tell that it is going to be controlling the higher mode effect contribution. If we have 0.5 or less period, this means that the contribution is nothing. There is no higher mode effect because it will be 1. If we go back here, look here, this is k here. So this means that a or alpha hx means that it is linear. But if we put this higher values, k going to be higher values, then we're going to have like higher, you know, kind of uh, curve that is going to be, instead of quadratic, it is actually ended with the quadratic. So this means that the maximum k value is going to be 2, as we mentioned. So this means that we are going to have something that is reflecting the higher mode effects, especially at the top floors. So this is the, uh, the, the point. If I ask you what is the contribution of k, it is for the higher mode effects. Okay, so that's the, the case here. No higher mode effects. And the curve of the deflection is going to be like, or the curve of the equation here is going to be like linear. But here too means that higher mode effect contribution, it is going to be something like this. Okay. And in between, it is in between, going to be some interpolation will be used here. Okay, so now, uh, although the actual first mode shape for a structure is also a function of the type of the seismic force resisting system, that effect is not reflected in this equation. Yes, that's right. We didn't mention in the, uh, uh, in the equation anything related to the system. What is the type of the system? Right? <laughs> that's, that's actually, uh, I cannot say any, anything about it except that it should, <laughs> it should uh, reflect the system because there, there must be some differences between the different systems and the, their way for the uh, distribution of the shear force. The horizontal forces computing using this equation equation 12, do not reflect the actual inertia forces imparted on a structure at any particular time. Instead, they are intended to provide design story shears that are consistent with enveloped, enveloped results from more accurate analysis. That's a very important concept. Okay? The equation does not give to us what is the inertia force at specific time, as some people could or would understand it or view it. But actually, this is not right. It's only like an envelope. It is consistent with uh, envelope results from more accurate analysis for the uh, buildings that is in California, as we said. Okay. Okay. Now let's have an example to end up and wrap up our our video. So the vertical distribution here. This is, as I said, the same example from Seismic Design Manual. We have a nine-story building, has a steel moment resisting frame for a lateral resisting system. As you can see, it is nine-story here, spans 27 foot. The weight of each floor is given here, and the height, as you can see, for all fro floors are given. Uh, the total weight is given, CS even given for us, 0.062, R it is 8, omega over strength, Three importance factor one and t the natural period is approximated one is 1.06 okay so what we want we want to determine the seismic base shear first and the vertical distribution exponent k which is controlling for the contribution of higher modes and the vertical distribution cvx and lateral seismic force fx at each level okay now let's go to the first part, it is very easy for us, which is the seismic base shear. Already, they give to us CS, given. So we will multiply it by the weight, which is the total weight of the building, 
and it would give us the total base shear. The second requirement is related to the vertical distribution component exponent, which is uh, k. And actually, if you go, we, we have our t, the t equal to 1.06. So if you look to the uh, values of the uh, this uh, between uh, between the uh, the 0.5 and 2. I think there's something here. Yes, yes, we are talking about 0.5 and 2.5, I'm sorry. So in the previous, I was talking about 2 as the limit, but actually it is 2.5, okay? So this is the 2.5. Our structure is having 1.06 here, which is here. This means that by interpolation, you can find that the corresponding k is 1.28. This means that, so this is actually the k that we have obtained, 1.28. You can make it by interpolation. So k is 1.28. We are going to use this value of k for the distribution. So now we have the vertical distribution for the third requirement is going to be equal CVX times V. CVX is going to be WX HX to the power k. We're going to make a table here. This is equation uh, 12 and this is equation 11. We're going to make a table for nine stories. H is going to be given, which is 20, 32, 42, 44, and so on, until floor, roof. And then this H, we're going to raise it to 1.28. Okay, K coming from the previous calculation, previous requirement. Then we can get H to the power K for each story, okay, for each floor. And then the weight is given already for each uh, floor, right? If you go back here, another one. So it is given already for each floor. We are going to put it as it is, okay, as you can see here. Okay, and the roof is the least one. And then we're going to multiply this by the h to the power k in this column. And then sum them up to get the summation, which is needed for the denominator of the CVX. So CVX is going to be uh, calculated based on the numerator here, which is already given for us here. So this value over the summation would give us the CVX. And then you can get the value for each floor Multiply the CVX by the V and you are going to get the uh, story shears, okay? So no need to do it by yourself. The computer can do it for, for you, but only it is important for you to have an insight into the, the building and into the structure. And you can check whatever the computer is doing by making this small kind of exercise for any structure that you have. Okay, we have some comments here, but I think I'm going to like give a brief of it. There are three main comments on this uh, system. He is talking about the dynamic response. If our structure is irregular, then we cannot use what we have done. We need to use a kind of dynamic analysis. This is the summary of the first comment here. And this is true. Another point is related, he was talking about redundancy. I don't know why he's talking about redundancy here, but anyway, uh, he is saying that if we are going to check redundancy, we are going to use the redundancy, as you know from the video of redundancy, we have uh, either 1 or 1.3, right? So he's telling that these base shears that we have calculated here, okay, these values, no need to be multiplied by 1.3 if, if you are going to design the individual members by using this base shear, this story shears multiplied by 1.3. So this means that redundancy factor may be taken at the analysis level and then in the design level you are not going to consider it or the opposite. You will not consider it in the analysis level, and when you are designing the individual member, use the redundancy. That's the rationale, and it's very logic, actually, but he put it here as a comment, okay? And the last one, it is, as I said, 
This is something related to uh, these analyses that we have done in this example. No need to make it every time. The software is going to do it for you, but it gives you an insight. This is the end of this uh, video. Thank you very much and see you in the next, uh, in the next video.